hi, Mark. It's great hi. to meet you. And thanks for taking the time. Um, so I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about Ceremonia. And I will just dive right in and you can interrupt me anytime. Okay, great. So I think we should start with a little bit about a founder story. Who am I? Um, I am a Swedish Latina. And I was born in Sweden, but... You speak Swedish? Yes. Ja. How do you speak Swedish? I can speak a little bit Swedish, but I have studied in Sverige for one year. Wow, where? Stockholm University. Fantastic. <laughs> wow, that was a, a, a fun a fun fact. <laughs> so I I grew up in Sweden, but in a very Hispanic family. Um, so both my parents are from Chile, and they migrated to Sweden during the Pinochet dictature. Um, so they came to Sweden thinking it was a temporary thing, and actually never learned the language because they kept thinking that they would eventually move back to Chile. Okay. Long story short, we never moved back to Chile, and my parents to this day actually don't speak any other language besides Spanish. So eventually I embarked on my career in the tech industry. I moved to Stockholm where I helped launch Uber, and uh, I had an amazing time at Uber. Um, this Swedish market became the fastest growing market for Uber at the time, um, mm -hmm. which sort of put me on an interesting trajectory within the company. So eventually I was relocated to the New York office and ended up in the US, fell in love with New York and left Uber after four years to join another startup called Away. Are you familiar with Away? I know Away and other founders, yeah. Yeah, you know, another sort of unicorn brand. And, and I joined them really early on as director of brand marketing. And then later on I left to start my own company I started a brand marketing agency. And during that time, I think it just really sort of became clear to me how still being in a country like the US where there are so many Hispanics, so many people like me, I still couldn't find myself represented in the business world or in the products that I consumed. Where are the brands that cater to Latinx? And where are the Latinx founders? Well, it turns out that there are not that many of us. There are only 58 Latina founders who have ever raised over a million dollars. I happen to be one of them. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy because Hispanics are the largest and fastest growing minority in the US. So we are introducing Ceremonia.com, the future of Latinx hair care. We're in the early stages of our business. We soft launched with pre-orders at the end of October and started to officially ship products on November 10. And I find ourselves to be in a very unique position. We are positioned for disruption between mass and class, between drugstore and D2C. We offer clean formulas at an accessible pricing while still maintaining 78% margins. We have an appealing brand with authentic values and trusted products that is accessible to the masses. This is the ceremonial ritual. When we launched in October, we introduced our first product, the one you see all the way to the left, the yellow one, I say to the Mosca. And mm -hmm. yesterday we introduced our second product, the Pecky Curl Activator. And these are all products that we already have in product development and that are ready to drop on a monthly basis. Since launch, we have acquired 25,000 Instagram followers, 25,000 email subscribers. We have over hundred raving product reviews of so five-star reviews. And we have cultivated an internal community that we call the Ceremonia Familia Insider Community. And these are women with Latinx backgrounds that help us to co-create. They test our products in sampling phase, they get pre-access to products, they create photo shoots with us, and they're really sort of an extension of our brand. We have seen great success with PR. We received over 50 press mentions since launch, including, you know, amazing outlets such as Vogue, Forbes, Allure, Fast Company. In December alone, we were included in 10 gift guides. And this is really interesting. 10% of our revenue since launch has been driven by PR directly. We have seen great sales. We reached $100,000 in sales in the first month of business. 
we increased our average order value to over $40, which is really interesting when you think about our price point. Our products are priced between $16 and $25, and we lowered our CPA to $34. We're now looking at an omni-channel strategy. We have soft commitments from leading fashion retailer to lead international expansion. We have received inbound from leading US beauty retailers. And we have interest from one of the biggest clean beauty players on Amazon. And we have already sold 3000 units to Birchbox. This is 2020 at glance with just about two months in business. When we look at 2021, our plans are to expand into wholesale launch in Europe with, with a strategic e-tail partner, expand our product line with monthly drops, accelerate our e-com growth through SEO, affiliates, paid, and PR, and increase repeat rates through subscriptions, loyalty programs, and gift cards, and continue to increase our average order value through smart bundles and limited edition merch. Thank you. Or gracias. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for going through that. Um, I have a, a bunch of questions, but I'll, let, let's start with just, you know, I'm curious to have to, you know, hear your questions. Yeah. So I basically have one big question for you, I guess. Uh, and I closed a pre-seed round um, in Q2 of last year and we raised $1 million and, and that was meant to carry us through launch. And we have run rate through July. So we're, you know, we, we have time. Um, but we have great momentum right now. We obviously are off to a great start. And what's really interesting is that our January sales have actually already surpassed our December sales, which is very, um, very unique for a month in business in January uh, in the e-com world, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, so I feel like we should use this momentum to go and raise our next round since we are going to need it eventually and mm -hmm. I think it's better to do it before you're in need. Um, but there has been so many shifts in the D2C space. I think we've seen a lot of not so successful IPOs and uh, D2C models mm -hmm. pumping in money and having inflated valuations with no sort of exit plan. And so I'm trying to stay cautious of, you know, learning from peers, um, but at the same time, not hold back. Um, and, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how would you approach just fundraising strategy in general for this type of category? Yeah, I mean, I'm always of the of the mind that you try to raise as much money as you can, that it's always very hard to raise money. Mm. And the market shifts sometimes it's it's easy to raise money and sometimes it's really hard depends on market conditions um it's been a particularly good good run for startups to raise money that could change so i, I would if you especially if your runway is july um that's really six months away so i i would definitely i would definitely raise if you can yeah um and you know you're talking about raising what probably a, a couple million dollars or something yeah i was thinking 1.5 million yeah okay so if you 1.5, but if you could raise more, raise more. I mean, you know, I think um, I always tell founders this is raise what you can. The dilution is not going to matter if you create a really successful business. Yeah, um, because that was going to be my next question. Like, I guess the only reason dilution would matter for me is like ownership, um, like more so control of the company, more so than like the dollars. Yeah, well, the, th there. the thing about control, not people, first time entrepreneurs, uh, or even serial entrepreneurs don't always fully appreciate that control of the board has nothing to do with ownership. Mm, so you can sure. control the company with a very small percentage of the company, or you cannot have control and have a very large percentage of the company. It's all about who controls the board yeah. uh, and what rights the, the investors have. And so, you know, what I, what I always like to do, especially in the early stage like this, is try and negotiate even a lower valuation um, for control and basically just say, no, I want, you know, X number of board seats to your one board seat because mm -hmm. I want to maintain control. Um, and, you know, that'll work well. Cause I think at the end of the day, they'd rather have a better valuation than have control for the most part. Yeah. Um, so, 
yeah, I would, I would separate those two. So if you think about it, instead of like percentage ownership, I like to focus on share price. So yeah. you know, what's the share price? To, you're raising money at a dollar a share. Great. Um, if I raise even more money at a dollar a share, um, yeah, my ownership goes down, but now I have more capital to get from one dollar to two dollars, two dollars to three dollars, three dollars to four. It's just like you know owning any stock. You 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 if you think you can raise money and increase the share price, you do it. Um, yeah. And and the share price takes into account dilution because there's more shares outstanding. And so if you raise more money, and that causes the share price to go down because you can't invested at all um, in any any way that makes the share price go up, then that's probably not smart. But I, it's very rare that that's the case. Usually you raise more money, you can grow the share price faster as a yeah. rule of thumb. And how would you go about like board in general? So right now I am the board of the company mm -hmm. since we only had a pre-seed round. And I, I, I would like to not, you know, go out and build a board yeah, you don't have to build a board. You can just simply, you could have three seats and then give the investor in the seed round one seat. Mm -hmm. so they have one of the four seats, you control the board, but you don't have to fill the seats because, yeah. then, you know, it gets more cumbersome. Just, yeah, and exactly. Basically keep them open. Um, and, uh, you know, in the future one day, maybe you would put independence in there or people you, you trust. But um, in, in the short term, no, just you just control three of the four seats. That's how you keep control. Yeah. Uh, very valuable. And even with additional rounds, if you're doing well, you could add more seats to yourself so that you continue to maintain control. So let's say you did a seed round, you gave away a board seat, you did an A and a B and you gave away two more seats. So you gave away three seats and you had three. Well, now it's 50-50, but you could actually give yourself another seat or two. So you have five and they have three. Yeah. Like you, depends on how well the business is doing and also depends on your leverage. You know, if you give a better valuation, sometimes you can keep control and stuff. So it depends on what's important to you. It sounds like control is important. So I would I would focus on that. Yeah, yeah. no, that's super valuable input because I, I definitely, you know, I feel you on the sense that it doesn't matter how much percent is you own. If the company's not worth anything, then congrats, you own 100 percent of nothing. Um, but I feel like the control part has definitely been something that yeah. has been bothering me. That's great. Yeah, and the more money you raise. Um, naturally the higher the valuation is. So that's another little like thing that people don't fully appreciate is like, if you go out and raise a million and a half at a, you know, just to make the math easy, you know, say, say a, a six pre money. So a one 7.5 post money, that's 20% dilution. Yeah. Um, if you go out and raise 5 million, maybe you would do that at a 10 pre. And yeah, it's, it's a third dilution, but the dilution is not that much more. You get an extra three and a half million. So it's not that you would have to raise 5 million at the same 6 million pre. The more money you're raising, the higher the pre money and post, because the more you can do with the money, like the more yeah. money you have, the more value the company is. So it's this, this like circular argument. I like when I do startups now, I like to raise like, you know, a hundred million to start, like just like seed because as long as you, you have a big enough idea to support it, yeah. Because you know the valuations got to be a lot higher than a hundred, right? Like it's you know what I mean. So yeah, it's that's interesting. You have money to put to work, so yeah. Because that's the other thing is when you are. I'm a sole founder too, so you know when I go out and fundraise, that compromises ops. You know you can't be doing hundred percent fundraising, hundred percent ops. So you don't want to be fundraising too often, ideally. No, absolutely. That's another good point. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, when I think about fundraising, it's, I'm always thinking about the next round, not the current round I'm raising for, but the next one. And so wanting to make sure that the investors that I bring in are the right investors, that they're getting in at the right valuation so they can see momentum and they can see a step up in the valuation for next round, because the investors you have, if you get the right investors, could be the ones to lead the next round, mm. certainly keep their pro rata. And so Thinking about the next round when you're thinking about the investors in this round is really important. Not all investors are created equal. If uh, you think about the deck that I just walked you through, is yeah. there anything there that you think is unnecessary or something that you wish I should have included if I were right. to, you know, go out and pitch you on this? <laughs> I have a few a few things. One, I would I love the story that you you told up front, but right before the story, I still would want to know what like, one slide like what is this company and where are you? So yeah. like, I have no idea, like, 
you know, what round, how many employees, how long you've been in existence, those like basics. Yeah. And then also what exactly is it like, is it an app? Are you a retailer? Are you D to C? Are you, do you make products? You like, just kind of like very simply, almost like you're talking to a 10 year old. Like, yeah. This is what it is. Just to say that this is what it is. This is where you are. And then you can kind of tell the story with more context. So it was, I was listening to the story, but I didn't know where it was going because I, I didn't even know what the, the business was at that point. Yeah. I think that's, that's something. I think another thing that's mi missing is the, the, the vision. Like, what are you hoping to create in 10 years? Like, if everything goes to plan, like, do you want to, you know, just take these, those products you showed me, those six products, seven products, whatever, and, and kind of just sell a lot of them and like that you'll be happy in 10 years? Or do you have a, a bigger vision? Do you, is it, is it a more holistic vision? Is it like, paint me a picture of how ambitious you're, you're thinking about mm -hmm. company long-term to get me as an investor excited that this, this is venture backable because venture capitalists, they're looking for that. They want to make sure they can come in and get a 20 X at this stage. Yeah, of course. So if you're coming in at a seven, 10 valuation, they want to make sure this is a multi hundred million dollar company. So I think painting the vision, I think, um, uh, you, you did size up the the size of the of the Hispanic market relative to the other part of to the overall market, mm -hmm. but That's I didn't see any, any numbers like yeah. like numbers like like size. And then what is your TAM like? How big is the market that you're targeting more specifically? And what share do you think is reasonable given some of the other players' share and some of the things? Paint a picture for me that comes after the vision that tells this is my big grand vision. And by the way, this is the size of the market. This is the piece we think we could take. This is a multi hundred million dollar kind of revenue opportunity here. Something, yeah. something of that word magnitude. The other thing that uh, I didn't see there, I think is really important in these B2C businesses is the unit economics. So basically you talked a little bit about your, your cost to acquire customer, but I'd want to know more about that and what you think the lifetime value of a customer is based on some early repeat rates. Even if you don't know exactly you can still paint a picture for me on like, this is what you think the revenue is going to be on, on, on the next five years per customer. This is the profit. This is how the profit compares to the cost to acquire a customer. And there's a really nice multiple. You should, your, your uh, five-year profit, I like to see at least, you know, three to four times the CAC or the yeah. cost to acquire a customer. And so, um, you know, if, if, if you got that well aligned and I feel good about the relationship, show me how you can scale marketing and spend more dollars at the same CAC? Yeah. Have you done any tests? Do you know that you can spend more money at that CAC? Convince me of that. That would be a, a key part uh, of it. And, and also, I think you spent a lot, you, you went through a lot of slides on sort of defining the problem. I think it could be even tighter. I mean, I yeah. think they're all really good um, parts of the problem, but I think you could probably get that on one or if not two, but ideally one slide that just really frames up the most important elements of, of the problem, the way you framed it up. Yeah. Super inspiring. I, I've been taking notes. <laughs> this is super <laughs> exciting. And I really appreciate the, the feedback on the deck. I feel like you want to tell a tight story, but then you also want to make sure that you're not leaving out important components. And, um, and I think having you with like a fresh set of eyes and with yeah. your experience, give this advice is super, super valuable. I'm sure it's like, like, like obvious things to you, but it's actually really, really valuable to me. So I really appreciate okay. it. Great. No, and don't don't be afraid to be transparent about things like, you know, you don't have the repeat rates right now because you don't have the products. And and just the more transparent you are, it gives confidence, the investors confidence. Because right now they're taking a bet on you in this round, this pre-seed. It's like a bet on you and the size of the market and your ability to execute. And so not every round is that's the case. You know, yeah. in later rounds, it's not as important, but in the early rounds, being transparent and, and sort of like that, you get it, you know, it's all about LTV and CAC relationship, you know, where the repeat rate needs to get to. This is why you're confident. You're thinking about it. You're, you yeah. know, I think that's, that's really important. There today. I can show where, yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good yeah, one. It's just, it's just your knowledge on it and that you're respecting that that is the whole game as opposed yeah. to like, we don't have the numbers yet. We're not really looking. It's, it seems not as strong of a yeah and i can i mean the thing is it's not like our numbers are 
are, are bad. It's just that I, I think they can be way better because we've yeah. only dropped a second product. So the sort of like only realistic repeat rate is people who bought the first product now buying into the second product. Whereas exactly. I think that when we have a more like a full routine and replenishment product, um, we'll start to see that tick yep. up for real. Exactly. All right. Well, well, it was great talking to you. Good I luck. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate it. No, I really, I really enjoyed it too.